Raise your hand if your row is not done. Okay, we got two rows left. There are long rows that require shuttling. So now I want you to tell me how many people are in your row. So how many people are in your row? How many people in this row? Nine. How many people in the second row? Eleven. Third row? Twelve. Fourth row? Fifth row? How many? Twelve? Six? Nine? Seven? Did you say seven? Ten? Row eight? Row nine? Did I hear six? Is that it? Is that the back row? Okay. So it took us about four minutes to do our sort. Okay, and that's after we figured out, you know, that included us some figuring out what we were doing, but it was mostly after we figured out to pass a pen to indicate who's doing a swap. So um, when you first started, though, you were also... I'm sorry, let me actually, um, I guess I'm already recording. Um, when you first started, you guys all started swapping at the same time. So we talked about last time the running time of bubble sort, um, and we said that, you know, each pass through the list takes N, right? So the first row to pass through the list once takes N comparisons, right? And then we had, how many times do we have to go through each list? In the worst case, we would have had to go through the first list nine times if the smallest element was last, right? So in the worst case, we have an n, n by n running time for bubble sort. OK, so um, if you had done in parallel, so if all of you did swaps at the same time, I wonder how that would change the running time. So if you guys paired yourselves up, how would that correspond to something in a computer? So if all the pairs, because you guys started this at the beginning, like all the pairs were doing comparisons, that's like multiple processors. So that's like running in parallel. So when we talk about running time for algorithms, we're usually not talking about running in parallel. We're talking about on a single processor. Um, so if you're running in parallel, you usually can reduce the running time by a whole lot. So what, what did, can we figure out the running time if we did a bubble sort as parallel as possible? So let's just do it for a really small example. Let's just say we have six items in our list. And if every, um, every odd one initiated a comparison, we could do those three at the same time, right? And then what would we need to do? After we do that, we would know that each of these pairs was in order, right? And then what would we do next? Have the... Okay, you said something about have the even pairs. So then we could do this. Okay. Oh, so you think we should could do this? Like that? 
So how many tries would it take? So usually um, the worst case still has to swap up to here, right? Because we're only swapping with adjacent things. So let's just say that six, let's say we were trying to order it from six down to one. So let's put the result of what we would get, right? Okay. I didn't hear that. What did you say? Oh, okay. One more of these. So let's just do the sort if it was in the reverse order. So this would be 2, 1, right? 4, 3, 6, 5. And then if we swap those, we would get 4, 1, right? 6, 3. Okay, and then we would get 4, 2, and 6, 1, 5, 3. And we can compare 4 and 6, we get 6 and 4, 2 and 5, we'd get 5, 2, and 1 and 3, we'd get 3, 1. So it's not quite done yet, right? One more. So then we're done. How many comparisons was that? So there's three there. And two, and three, and two, and three, and two. But each of them was run in parallel. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's not bad. And we probably could have also done ones on the ends. So we could have done the last one and the first one together on the times we were doing two, and we probably would have reduced it even more. So there's ways to make algorithms um, shorter if we can use parallel processing. But um, normally, our program, our computers aren't even set up for us to access our parallel processes. Um, so we can't really do it unless we have a setup for that. So we have other algorithms that, though, can actually take advantage of divide and conquer. And so we talked about merge sort. So I wanted to do this as a class too. So we're going to, so I'd like you to get your number back. So let's go find your number. And then we're going to sort again. So merge sort, merge sort splits your list into two piles and then splits it into two and into two into two. And then at the very end of the merge sort, you have like the lowest list that you have to sort as pairs. Okay? So that's what we're actually going to do now is you should compare your number with your neighbor. So you kind of need to see if you're, you know, evenly paired. So do try to evenly pair, not leave anybody out. Uh, let's do the same sort. So smaller over here and bigger over there. What did you say? If, if you have 11, it's, it's fine. The last one's already sorted. So you're going to sort by pairs. So smaller this way, larger this way. So doubles, let's figure it out first before you do it. So I want to make the algorithm first. So if we think about taking a list, hold on, let's not do it yet. I didn't, so I got this process online, but it's not, it's not def definite enough. Okay? So what we want to do is actually merge our lists as we sort them. So with your neighbor, you're going to put them in order, but put the smaller one on top and put them together. Okay? 
And then the two pairs next to each other will then put their two lists together. Now, how do you merge two lists? All you have to do is look at the top of each one, compare those, and put it, you know, turn it over, and then compare the top of those. So merging the list doesn't take very long. So I want you to merge your pairs and then merge again. So we're going to do this in pairs and then quadruples and then eights. Okay, you should be merging two sets of four now. Are you guys done over here? What's going on? Okay, that sort took us about two minutes. Okay, did you have trouble doing that? Why do we have trouble doing it? We're not a computer? Okay, how do you merge two piles that are sorted? They're both sorted. How do you merge two piles that are sorted? You, some of you just did it, so you should be able to say. Right, so you can just say, take the two piles, and whichever one is smaller, you turn that over. That's the new top, right? And then you just repeat until there's nothing in the lists. Because you know they're sorted, so you can just do pairwise. But as you keep turning over the smallest one, you're going to go through the entire list. So merging, how many operations does merging take? So if I have n items in my list, that I'm merging, then I actually have two lists of n over 2, right? And so I won't have to do more than n over 2 comparisons. Because at most, I'm just turning over one list, which is all smaller than the other list, and then I just put the two stacks together. Right? No? Let's see why. So let's say I have two piles. And they're both sorted. If I have to merge these, I do one comparison here, right? One is smaller, so it goes in my list. So now I'm doing a comparison here. Sorry, two and four, right? Two is smaller, so it goes in my list. Now I'm doing a comparison three. Three is smaller, so it goes in my list. And now the rest of four, five, and six goes in because I don't have to do any more comparisons. Once one of the piles is empty, I just put the rest of that in the list. Any questions about that? So let's look at another list just to make sure it's easy or everybody gets it. So if we're making our if we're merging our two lists here, we get one. Then we do two and four. Then we do 7 and 4, 7 and 5, 7 and 6, 7 and 10, and then 10 and 8. So as soon as the last one's taken off the list, whatever's in the other list gets put in the end. So let's see how many comparisons we get there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Is that how many comparisons we did? So yeah, it's n instead of n over 2. So it's good to work through it. OK, 
Okay, so merge sort is a lot faster, even when we do it here in the list, because that merging operation doesn't take very long, right? Because all I have to do is very easy to make the decisions, and uh, the lists are already sorted. So merge is a lot faster, and you can basically take care of the computer, basically splits out the tasks. So it's not parallel, but it acts like it is. So in terms of the computation you have to program in your sorting algorithm, all you're doing is doing one comparison and a merge at all the levels. So it's not a hard operation. And we didn't have to go through the list multiple times. Okay, so we're going to actually look at what the running time for uh, merge sort is. So the algorithm for merge sort So I'm making a funny notation for uh, merge sort my list over two. So what I mean by list over two is just start at the second half. So this is the first half, and this is the second half. So if my list is, say, an array from one to n, this would be the array from one to n over two. Let's assume that n is even, just to make it easy. And this would be n over two plus 1 all the way up to n. So whatever the running time of merge sort is, if I have n elements in my list, usually we use t for running time, t for time. So Sorry, I'm just going to say. We'll call it T of N, okay? And that means that if I do merge sort on a list that's half the size, then that's how long does it take to run? It's T of N over 2. And how long, how many of those do I have to do? Two of them. And then I also have to do this thing called merge, right? I'm just going to call it M. So whatever the time for merge is. But if I have to merge two lists with uh, size N, we know that it's just going to be N. So we'll just add N to that. Okay, so that's actually our running time for merge sort. The problem is that's recursive, right? So we don't actually know what that is unless we plug in some prior values. So what is um, T of 2? All we have to do is merge, right? Our basis is if we only have one item, we don't have to do any sorting. Um, so... All we have to do is merge two things. So I'm sorry, it should be one. I just looked at one thing and wrote down the other. All right, so we need to actually figure out like a table of values for T event. So what is T of four? So it's going to be 2 times t of 2 plus 4, right? Now one trick that we do in computer science when we're trying to figure out running time for algorithms is we don't do stuff for all the numbers. We do stuff for the numbers that are convenient to calculate with. So I didn't do 3 because we can't divide 3 evenly by 2. So in fact, I'm just only going to look at numbers 
that are powers of 2. So let's figure out what this is anyway. So we get um, 2 times t of 2, which is 1, plus 4, right? So the next number, that's the power of 2, is 8. It's going to be 2 times t of 4 plus 8, right? And we can plug that in. Let's do t of 16. That's 2 times t of 8 plus 16. And I'm going to write it with powers of 2. Did I write this out right? No, I didn't do that. There's a 3 right there. So let's multiply that out. We get 2 cubed plus 2 to the 4th, plus 2 to the 4th. I feel like I have a mistake in there. Any mistakes? Oh, thank you. So let me just do that. So then we get 2 times 2 cubed, so that would be 2 times 2 to the 4th. Let me do this again so we can write it better. So we're trying to figure out the pattern. We can put the numbers and look at them, but when we're trying to figure out a recursive uh, pattern, we want to write it in such a way that we can figure out a formula. So I'd like you to write these out and see if you can figure out a formula for this. So I'm trying to get it to a point where we can look at each of these and figure out the formula. So this is going to be 2 squared plus 2 squared, 2 cubed. times 2 squared. My brain's not working today. I need some help from you guys. So that's going to be 3 times. It's going to be 2 cubed plus 2 times 2 to the 4th, 3 times 2 to the 4th. Anybody got a guess on 2 to the 5th yet? Any guess looking at this pattern? And so if we use that pattern, does everybody see the pattern we got there? So we're going to make a guess 
that t of 2 to the k is going to be Let's see. So the 5 is the k. So it's going to be k minus 1. 2 to the k minus 1, right? Plus k minus 1 times 2 to the k. All right, so this is actually, this is not for n, right? We just did it for powers of 2. Yeah? Do we always have lists that are size powers of 2? No, we don't. But we don't actually really care because when we're trying to figure out running time, we just want to get an estimate, right? So if I have more than um, 2 raised to some power k, but it's less than the next 2 to the k plus 1, I know it's somewhere in between those two estimates. Okay, but I can also remember that n equals 2 raised to the k, right? So to, I can actually translate this back into what does this mean in terms of n? So 2 to the k minus 1 is what in terms of n? 2 to the k minus 1 is 2 to the k over 2, right? So that first term is n over 2. So if I'm trying to write t of n, the first term is n over 2. And what is that's 2 to the k, so the second term has an n in it. What's k minus 1? How do I get the k by itself in this equation? Did I hear something? Log base 2 of both sides. So k is equal to log of n, so k minus 1 is log of n minus 1. Right? So k minus 1 times 2 to the k is going to be log n minus 1, and 2 to the k was n. So our expression is going to be t of n equals n over 2 plus log n minus 1 times n. All right, can we do one more combination to make this a little simpler? Yes, you can combine the n over 2 and the n, right? Thank you. I knew I made a mistake there. So there's a minus. So that's our running time for merge sort. So what's the big O of that? N log N. Because we ignore sums. And N log N is an upper bound for this, right? So if I have a subtraction going on, that means it's going to be less than N log N. So when I, if someone says, find the big O of this expression, um, normally we are doing comparisons, so that was a question on Piazza, which is a good question. But if I'm just asking you for the big O, and there's no, I'm not giving you something to compare with, then what I'm asking you to do is find the smallest big O estimate. So that means the smallest upper bound for the running time for the algorithm, if that's how many commands you have to do, where there's no sums and there's no constants. Okay, so when I'm talking about wanting to understand big O, I don't want to see any constants out front, and I don't want to see any sums unless they're in some exponents. So you can leave them in powers, but don't leave them on the ground. Okay? Now, um, what we would want to do next is prove that this uh, is actually the closed form for the recurrence we have. Um, 
But since we're already done with that, and you guys did okay on the test on that part, uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, but if someone wants me to, I will, I will post a proof that this, these two things are equal on, on Piazza. So just post a question if you want me to prove that. So the reason why I showed you, you this to, sorry, this to you, painful as it was, I apologize for that, um, is that this is one of the ways that we estimate the running time for algorithms. So when we have a recursive algorithm, we need to find the closed form for that algorithm to actually find out how long it's going to take to run. So when we do divide and conquer, we're usually dividing our problem up into parts, and we do a recursion, and we actually need to find the closed form to understand how many, how many um, steps we're going to have to take on our computer. And this trick of replacing n with 2 to the k is a really common trick in computer science, and that's why you have logs and stuff in computer science. Because we can calculate things that are powers of 2, and we can divide them by 2 as many times as we want and not deal with any leftovers, right? That's why we do that trick in computer science, is because we can divide things by 2 and not deal with leftovers. Yes? 2 happens a lot because it's our favorite number. Right? Also, we have switches that have two values. So two comes up a lot for a lot of reasons. Um, probably because we're human. Like if we had like five hands, we'd probably have five as our thing. But two's our thing because we have two of them. <laughs> okay. So it's the abstraction that we figured out. If we could figure out how to do things with, you know, usefully by separating things into three sets, we would do that. Um, but it's much easier to separate things into two sets. Okay. Any questions about this? Now, the reason, why, the reason why I did this actually is because you have a problem like this on WebAssign that's asking you to plug in the definition of a recurrence enough times so that you can see the pattern of what the recurrence actually, the solution of it is. And so it's going to ask you to type out like what I got on these or else one of these. So you need to look at the formula like the final thing on WebAssign to see like what you need to type in. But it's not just asking you to put the answer. It's asking you to put the form of the answer so you, as you looked at the rows, you could actually see what the pattern is. Okay? So that's why we went through that. Um, but if you do have trouble figuring out what to put on WebAssign, make sure that you uh, post a question on Piazza. Um, I regret to let you guys know that Marcus is not going to be one of your TAs anymore. He got a job. Um, with a professor, so he's still a student, but um, who knows, though, he might still answer questions on Piazza because he loves to answer them in six minutes or less. So I keep trying to beat him, and hmm, I can't beat him. We post at the same time all the time, so anyway. Uh, all right, so let's do a few problems where we just actually try to find the smallest big O estimate for a function. So here's a few examples. And they are also on page 10 in your packet. And the example I just did, by the way, of solving the binary search recurrence is on page 12 of your packet 4. Um, so we have uh, the first function we're going to look at is 1 half of n squared minus n. So we don't want any constants or sums in this. But remember that our algorithm for finding the big O estimate Turn it off. Okay, so our algorithm is actually to find the largest term. So what's the largest term here? n squared. Replace all the terms with the largest. And then that automatically makes a function that's bigger. Except for when we have a minus. Right? So we can actually, anything that's subtracted, we could just ignore it. So that's what we should do. We shouldn't subtract that, we should just ignore something subtracted. Because it's technically not a sum, it's a subtraction. So when we have a subtraction, you can just ignore all the small terms. Because the first term is bigger than the subtraction. Okay? So now we've just shown that, let's say this is f of n. We've just shown that f of n is in what? Big O of n squared. And what is the constant? It's a half. And what is our starting value for n? k equals 1. I didn't do any replacement, so it should work for 1, right? So when you get asked for the big O 
estimate, smallest big O estimate, make sure you don't leave a constant on the front. So don't leave that one half on there. Don't leave a 17. Don't leave any numbers on the front. Yes, Philip. K is 1 because we'd like to pick 1. Because there's no logs in this problem. If there's a log, we pick 2. It's arbitrary. You, you can pick whatever you want. But K equals 1 is what we're going to pick by default. You have a question? You can pick K equals 4. You can pick anything you like. That's going to make it actually true. All right, let's try this one. So let's say that uh, is n or log n or 1 our largest function here? n. So this is less than or equal to 5n plus 5, sorry, plus n plus n, which is equal to 7n. And so I've just shown that f of n is in big O of n. Constant is 7, k equals 1. We just use k equals 1 all the time, except we have a log, so we need to use 2. We technically don't have to because we didn't, there's no log in our final answer, so that's okay. So this is actually a proof that this function is in that big O. So these are as easy as they look. They're not, they're, these are not meant to be hard or confusing. All we're trying to do is make a simpler looking function so it's easy to do comparisons. All right, last one, log of n cubed. Are there any sums in there? Yes. Because log of a product is a sum of logs, right? So log of n cubed is actually 3 log n, right? And so that's n. They go of log n, constant is 3, k okay, equals 2. So I didn't have to make less than or equal to because that just is the function. There's Now I drop the constant of 3, and I don't have any sums, so I'm okay. So when I ask you to find big O, all I'm trying to do, get you to do is get rid of all the sums that aren't in exponents and drop the constants. Now if I multiply two of these together, we already know from last class that if we do that, the big O of both of these, the smallest big O estimate, is the product of their big O estimates. So I can do each of these and multiply it so this function is in n squared times n, which is equal to n cubed. So when I give you a function like that, you don't have to multiply it out and then do some stuff. You can find the big O for each of, each of the terms and then multiply them. Okay, if I give you um, a function like absolute value of x, is that in big O of x? Yes, because it's less than or equal to some constant times x. How about the floor of x? Is that in big O of x? Yes, can you prove it? What is the floor of x? The floor of x, but does anybody know the definition? It is the nearest integer below or equal to x. Okay, so it's the integer part of x, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so it's the nearest integer that's less than or equal to x. So this is always less than or equal to x, right? By definition, it's the nearest integer that is less than or equal to x. So therefore, it is always less than or equal to x. So it is in big O of x. How about the ceiling of x? So that's the nearest integer that is greater than or equal to x. So it's the smallest integer that's greater than or equal to x. Okay, what's the biggest that that could possibly be? 
x plus 1. It has to be less than that, strictly less than x plus 1, right? So now x plus 1 is in big O of x because it is less than or equal to 2x, right? If I just replaced all the terms with x, then I would just get 2x. So now this is in big O of x. So don't let things trip you up. Um, I saw that, well, you and your, your TA saw that you guys actually did let that trip you up on the test um, that we have to give back to you at the end of class today. Um, problem number two, which had the predicate calculus proofs, was not a hard problem, uh, except that you guys didn't get it. So I guess it was hard. So it was an easy proof, and you had to write some subset statements in predicate calculus, and the average on that problem was 58%. So not looking too good on that one. But the rest of the test is not too bad. Okay, so let's do a couple more. Um, one thing is uh, that you may have forgotten, so I'm going to remind you, that you really should print out the homeworks before you go to WebAssign. Because if you don't, and then you're trying to work problems on WebAssign, you're probably looking at them going, what am I supposed to put in those boxes? How many people have thought that? What am I supposed to put in those boxes? Okay, like if you're not raising your hand, you're lying. So I know that all of you look at it and go, what the heck am I supposed to put in those boxes? However, if you have already printed out your homework and worked it, it is super obvious. So you should print out the homework and work it because it's exactly like what we're going to have on the test. So, for example, one of your problems has a function like this. It's not going to be exactly this, but it's going to be so prove that f of x is big O x to the fourth. So if you use the algorithm that we've talked about in class, the proof for this, all you do is you take every single term and you replace the x function with the largest x function that you see. So this is now less than or equal to x to the fourth is obviously the largest, plus 10x to the fourth, plus 7x to the fourth, plus 4x to the fourth. So the boxes on WebAssign correspond to writing that down. So if you remember, I told you guys, the way I made the WebAssign was I worked the problems, and then I erased part of them with, and put boxes. So that's why it looks funky when you look at it and you haven't tried to work the problem. Because the purpose of WebAssign is not for you to figure out how to fill in boxes. It's an automated grader for you to type your answers into and have them graded fast. So remember that. All right, so now what do we do with this? Well, the other thing we have to write is this is only true if what? X is greater, X is greater than or equal to 1 because I can't replace 4 with 4X squared if X is 0, right? So that's only legal. This is only legal and only works if X is at least 1. Now what do I do next? Add them all up. So I add 4 and 7 is 11 plus 10 is 21 plus... 1 is 22. So now I've just shown that f of x is less than or equal to 22x to the fourth, right? So therefore, that's what these little triple dots your math teachers write. That means therefore, f of x is less than or equal to c times x to the fourth. c equals 22. By the way, um, if you are typing your questions on Piazza and um, you want to use this symbol, it's just a backslash in. So when you're typing on Piazza, you can write your equations in the middle of these double dollar signs. And you can write most math the way you would expect to write it, but you wouldn't know how to write the in symbol. So it's just a backslash and the word in. I had a hard time finding that on the button, so that's why I was telling you. So if you're writing in LaTeX on the Piazza forum, that's what you do. 
So this is an easy problem. It should be easy, but it looks hard on, on WebAssign because the, there's a bunch of boxes. But it's not actually hard. OK, and then you have a few proofs to do. You have some more multiplication problems. Oh, I wanted to do one of these. OK, so we're going to do a recursively defined set. So I'm going to make a set called E, and the first element in it is going to be 0. And I'm also going to give you one more element. So when I recursively define a set, I need to give you a basis. And then I need to give you an inductive or recursive rule, recursive. Okay, so I've just given you two rules. What set is this? It's a set of even numbers. So this is a recursive definition for the set of even numbers. Once I have a definition for a set that tells me how to grow it, I can prove things inductively with that definition. So. An induction has a basis, and it has an inductive step, right? So if I want to prove something for all the even numbers, like that they're all divisible by 2, then I can do that with induction. OK. so. The reason why we're doing this awkwardly simple example is because it shows you the structure of how to prove something for a recursively or inductively uh, defined set. Okay? So our basis is, you know, 0 over 2 is 0, and 2 over 2 is 1, and there are no remainders, so both of them are divisible by 2. So when we construct the rest of this, what we need to do is use our, our inductive definition for the set to construct the induction. So we have to grow the same way that the induct, that the same way our set does. So our induction has to grow in, in all the same directions. If I didn't, then I couldn't guarantee that everything in the set has the property. So I have to go in all the directions. So what I need to do is look at the left-hand side here. So I'm going to assume that. So I'm assuming that A is in E, then 2 divides A. So my inductive growth has two sides. So this is where I start, and this is where I go. 
So the place where I start has to be in the assume, and then the prove has to be the things that result from that assumption. So I want to prove that a plus 2 is divisible by 2, and a minus 2 is divisible by 2. Because those are the two things that I grew from A. So I start with something that I have in the set, and then I go to the other things that I made in the set out of that. So that's what we do with regular numbers, right? So when we do a regular induction, we start with N, which is just a number in the numbers, and the way we get to the next one is N plus 1. So that's how we grow our regular inductions. So if we are growing a set a different way, then we have to do the induction a different way. So that's our setup. Any questions about the setup? Okay, so how do I start to prove that A plus 2 is divisible by 2? Well, it's already written in terms of A, right? And what else can I write? If A is divisible by 2, then I can write it as what? Okay, so I can write A as 2K. So A plus 2 can be written as 2K plus 2. Can you prove that that's divisible by 2? Yes, because I can factor 2 out. So that's the first thing I have to prove. Now I have to prove the second one, that a minus 2 is divisible by 2. So a minus 2 is equal to 2k minus 2, which is equal to 2 times k minus 1. And that means that a minus 2 is also divisible by 2. This is basically, remember that we talked about integers being closed under addition and subtraction. That is why, because now we've just written a minus 2 in terms of 2 times another integer. So since k was an integer, then k minus 1 has to be an integer. So we're using that definition. I'm not making you write that, but technically that's what we're using. So you have a problem just like this on your homework where you have a recursively defined set, and it has a funky looking picture on WebAssign. So it's going to give you a set like this. So you have 0, 0 in T, and you have a rule that if MN is in T, then I think it was M plus 1. So if you have um, a point in T, then you can define three more points. So 0, 0 is our first point, And just using our inductive rule, what are the three points that 0, 0 makes? So this first one is 1, 0, right? The next one is going to be 1, 1. And the next one's going to be 1, 2. So in the picture, it actually has an upside-down version of this. So it puts 0, 0 on the bottom, and then it starts making a tree. So each one of these has three kids that are made with the inductive rule. So 1, 0 is going to give me 2, 0, 2, 1, and 2, 2. And then the problem asks you to prove, so after you figure out some more points in the set, it's going to ask you to prove
an inequality for each of the um, points that you have in the set. So what you're going to have to do is do a basis for 0, 0. So you're going to prove that 2 times 0 is greater than or equal to 0. And then you have to assume that if you have AB in the set, then 2A is greater than B, greater than or equal to B. And then you need to prove for all three new points that 2 times the left side is going to be greater than or equal to the right side. So you'll have three proofs, three little proofs that you need to do. So that's my hint for that. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to do is um, <clears throat> tell you about your tests. Okay, so the overall average is a 72.94. That is out of 100. Your web assigned grade is reporting out of 112, but it's going to be out of 100. So um, sorry about that. When we uploaded them, we uh, should have put 100 on the number of points. So these are the scores. So these are how many points are out of each. All the problems were worth 12 except for number 6, which is worth 16 points. Um, these are the percentages of, like, the percent of the points everybody got. And then these are the percentages out of the people who actually tried the problem. So it looks like a lot of people didn't do number six, which is a shame because it had the highest number of points um, on the test. Um, so it looks like you really didn't get number two and not so much on number six either. So those are the ones you ought to I'll to review. So I've got the folders up here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spread them out on the front tables so you can come pick up your test.